Hey guys, this is Nikki, and welcome to How to Make an Esports Game Part 2. We're going to be talking about game balance today, and if you missed Part 1 or you need a little bit of context, I'd recommend clicking the annotation on the screen or link in the description to go back and watch that one first. Round 1. Your objective is to work as a team to kill your targets. To start off this episode, let's talk a little bit about the gameplay. Last week's gameplay was just an 11k standard beatdown on a bunch of bumblebees. Today, since I'm talking about how to make an esports game, I figured why don't I show a competitive match. This match I don't score as high as I usually would when I play against a bunch of people who have about two brain cells in their head. Today, this is actually a match against a bunch of people who are very, very high leveled. And this is actually a 3v4 for most of the game, and the random person who joins us isn't very good. This engagement we're having right here is one of the craziest ones I've ever been in in my life. And by the way, these glitches can't happen if we want a competitive game. But anyway, everyone is going to get a taste of this poll on each team. We're going to be smashing heads into this thing, breaking skulls, and there are going to be stuns flying everywhere. Because it's a 3v4 right now, I'm down one person on my team. And they have all their abilities ready since the beginning of a manhunt match. I didn't mean to steal Kang's poison right here, and I felt really bad for doing that. I had the other Bieber locked, but for some reason it prioritized the other one because he was poisoned and he was about to stun me. So I didn't get the kill right here. And we still have more stuns flying around. We're going to come out of this engagement down about 2,000 points, which isn't very good. But I hope you guys enjoy this competitive match in the background while I talk about the competitive side of gaming. So today we're talking about game balance, and in the previous episode I talked specifically on AC3 and I may or may not speak specifically on AC3 for this match, but I'm trying to make this series as general as possible because any commentator can talk about what they want to see in AC4. This is going to be an overall view of how to make an esports game because that's the name of the series. Without further ado, game balance. Why is game balance important? Well, to summarize what I said in the last episode, we need a bunch of balance so spectators don't have to watch the same thing over and over. And we need balance so pro players aren't so constrained to use one ability set. Because if you look at AC3 Manhunt, and I'm going to speak very briefly on this, you don't use even half the abilities in this game. Where I can only think of five off the top of my head. Throwing knives, gun, anima shield, smoke, and wipe. And I'm using firecrackers. And every now and then you'll see a tripwire bomb. Other than that, you really don't see poison dart, disruption, money bomb. God, if you brought a money bomb to a competitive Manhunt game, prepare to get your face punched in. Unless the other people just aren't doing so well. But there are a bunch of abilities that aren't used in AC3. And that's why it's not a very competitive game. And that's why it's not very popular in the esports community. Is because the game balance is a bit lacking. Now there are multiple ways to play AC3. But every playstyle isn't as valuable as the other. Because there are dominant abilities in this game. Take for example, Smoke Bomb versus Closure. If you wanted to stop someone from running away, which would you rather use? An offensive Smoke Bomb? or closure. Me personally, I'd rather use closure because I don't want to be a douchebag, but the sensible thing to do in a competition, say a million dollars was on the line, is to throw an offensive smoke bomb over to that person. Thus, because AC3 has dominant abilities and dominant playstyles, its metagame is pretty poor, and because its metagame is pretty poor, that's just one more reason it isn't very successful in the esports arena right now. Now, I'm not going to speak specifically on how to balance AC3 or AC4, because any commentary can just come up here and say what they would like on that topic. We're here to talk about something a little deeper. And game balance actually isn't as easy to achieve as you would think it is, because you have to balance game balance and game dynamic, which I will tell you what I mean by that in a second. But people can just come up on the mic and say, hey, you should take out Smoke Bomb, Throwing Knives should do this, etc. Well, we don't know exactly what specifically the abilities will do. And we also have to take into consideration that AC and any video game in this day and age is very dynamic. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Let's take, for example, the game of Rock, Paper, Scissors. You may have heard of it before. That is as balanced of a game as you can possibly get. Now, there is a little bit of psychology behind it. Guys do tend to choose Rock more. Girls do tend to Scissors more often. But let's just totally pass that up. Let's say there's a 33.333% chance that you can pick any ability in Rock, Paper, Scissors. And I just call them abilities. So I guess that's what I'll reference them as. Rock beats Scissors. Scissors beats Paper. Paper beats Rock. Everyone knows that. That is as balanced as it could possibly get. Now the reason Rock, Paper, Scissors isn't an esports game is because it has absolutely no dynamic to it. It is so boring and straightforward. Rock, Paper, Scissors may have the best game balance of any game ever, but it has absolutely no dynamic to it, which is why game developers aren't going around and making Rock, Paper, Scissors into a game, and that's why the MLG doesn't host competitive Rock, Paper, Scissors tournaments. For a game to be successful in the competitive gaming arena, it needs to have a high amount of game balance and a high amount of game dynamic. Once again, I regretfully say, let's take for example, League of Legends. Oh god, it leaves this weird taste on my tongue. 
That game, I'll admit, has a really high amount of game balance. Every champion in that game can be used almost equally. And you can also pick from, I'm sure there are hundreds of them. I don't know the exact number, but that's a very dynamic game with hundreds of champions. And each of them is a viable option for a competitive game. That's why LOL is so successful in the esports market right now. A quick note on the gameplay, man, some people on the other team are pretty high prestige, but despite that, 3v4, my team is ahead by 60 points. Let's see if we can pull this together and win the defense round as well. Like I said, Rock, Paper, Scissors isn't very popular because of its low amount of game dynamic, but it does have a high amount of game balance. LOL is popular because it's got both. And let's also talk about the different ways games are balanced. Anyway, this commentary isn't fully about AC3 and Rock, Paper, Scissors. Let's talk about other games that are successful in the eSports community. Now, Black Ops 2 is another one of those games. I am fairly well versed in Black Ops 2's metagame. I'm not super MLG pro, but I absolutely know what I'm doing when I'm on the sticks for that game. Black Ops 2 is a fairly successful eSports game. A little recently, we had the COD Championships, and if you watch that, there were a ton of guns being used in Black Ops 1. In an MLG match, you saw FAMAS, FAMAS, FAMAS. That's all you saw. That was one gun. That gun was good at close range, long range. That gun was just the go-to gun. It was way too versatile. And if one gun or ability or whatever is too versatile, then people are just going to use it for every situation. That was the FAMAS in Black Ops 1. You saw very little of any other weapon. The FAMAS basically dominated Black Ops 1. Over in Black Ops 2, with the new Pick 10 system, you can pick multiple perks. You can take more grenades, more attachments on your guns. And that is one contributor to the huge variety I saw over at the COD Championships. Not only that, but in first-person shooters, typically, you will see very few guns being used. I saw a huge percentage of Black Ops 2's guns being used. We saw four assault rifles, almost all the SMGs being used. I saw an LMG, a shotgun. I saw a sniper rifle being used. Some dude was sniping in the COD Championships. And if you don't play COD, in past Call of Duties for professional gameplay, sniping definitely is not the most viable option but some guy was using a dual band dsr sniping people across the map because it was a viable strategy because those guns are balanced and they actually would take a few people off the board in a search and destroy match which is important because you can't respawn there and teams would actually win because people were spawn sniped right off the bat at the beginning of the match and that's what i like to see a bunch of different perks are being used different grenades and the way you win a competitive match is supposed to be to identify the other team's strategy and I come up with a counter to it. And the team that loses is the team that at the end of the day can't find a counter to the other team's strategy. And as a spectator, that's what's fun to watch. It's fun for one team to say, oh, this guy's doing this, so let's start doing this. And the other team responds to that counter and their counters to counters. And it just gets insane how they're trying to get into each other's minds. That's what's fun to watch. And as a shoutcaster, because that's what I'm doing for AC3, that's fun to talk about how people are developing strategies sometimes even on the spot you got to be quick when you're trying to figure out what people are doing I'm sure that teams have planning and they preemptively say hey this team might use this so let's do this but as a shoutcaster it's fun to say this team's doing this now oh my god this team's being brilliant and responding like this that's what's fun that's why we need variety in our games so COD has a fair amount of game balance and a fair amount of game dynamic to it and to figure out COD specific game balance it's not actually a really complicated concept we have guns that are good at close range, submachine guns, shotguns, guns that are good at medium range, which are typically assault rifles. And then we have guns that are good at long range, LMGs and sniper rifles. We have guns with high rates of fire but low damage. For example, the Scorpion shoots at 1250 rounds per minute, which is super fast, but it has a really low amount of damage. And then we got your high damage, low rate of fire weapons like sniper rifles or pump action shotguns. So that's why COD's a pretty good esports game, and let's move on to Pokemon. I used to play competitive Pokemon, but its metagame is so changing that I probably wouldn't do very well if I were to be dropped into a tournament right now. I'm really out of practice, but I got like my type matchup chart memorized faster than my multiplication table back in like second grade. Anyway, right now there are 649 Pokemon, and that's before the release of Pokemon XY, which I believe is going to be the next generation, which is going to have 100 plus more added to it. 649 Pokemon. You might be thinking to yourself, there is no way that is balanced, and that is absolutely true. There is a different way that competitive Pokemon players balance their games. Now, 649 Pokemon is like having 649 abilities and 649 different guns. It's just crazy. There is no game that can have that many components of gameplay to be used that can all be balanced. So competitive players do it in a different way. I'm going to stick to the original 151 because that's mostly what people know. But Pokemon is balanced in tiers. So, for example, we have Caterpie, which is in the bottom tier, 
because no one's going to use a Caterpie in a game or a Magikarp. But we also have the top tier, which is like Mewtwo. Mewtwo would absolutely wreck a Magikarp. And they have the tier system, right? So you pick a tier and you play in that tier and below. So for example, if I picked the overused tier, which is the second highest tier, I can use Charizard and Blastoise and Pokemon like that all the way down to Caterpie, but I can't use Mewtwo because that's in a tier above. And this also applies to racing games. You have your motorcycle tiers, your actual racing car tiers, you can drive vans. I haven't played a lot of racing games, but racing games also work on this premise. And the reason that this isn't a very successful esports game, Pokemon or games that use this tier system, is because the tiers aren't very well advertised. Unless you're a competitive player like me, they can't tell you that Blissey's in the OU tier. And let's switch back to gameplay talk for a second. I'm gonna get a hidden escape at the very last second and save by the bell. I didn't get my face smashed into the window, but that's how you do it. That's how you finish in first place. Just be a complete badass. You don't need your offensive smoke bombs or guns or wipes. Just be a pro. Don't be like these losers and throw a bunch of offensive smokes everywhere. Crutch themselves for their lack of skill. No, no, just be like me. Be awesome. Anyway, to summarize what I was saying earlier, that's why tier-based games aren't very popular, and there are some other reasons which I'll talk about in the next episode, but basically people don't understand the tiers of competitive Pokemon, some people don't even know that there are tiers or that there is competitive Pokemon. There aren't really many competitive racing games, and I will address this in the next episode when I talk about what game developers can do besides changing the gameplay that'll help push their game towards esports. Thank you guys for watching. If you want to leave a like and a comment for a little bit of discussion, I will be reading through them then please feel free to do so. My older videos on the screen. I'm Nikki and I will see you all some of the time.